Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. When I heard that my friend Jim LaRocca recently retired from the Public Service Commission, I asked him to come to talk about government and politics. His career in public service has spanned 40 years, and I'm sure he's got a lot to say. Can you believe it, 40 years? I reject the idea it's been 40 <laughs> years. I, have, I, deny, I deny it. Okay, so how do you feel? I feel good. I good. feel good. I've retired from so many, so many times from government yeah, jobs. I know. Uh, this is my latest retirement. Okay, that's so, great. Yeah. But you've always been my environmental consultant and, and mentor and aid educator. Um, so let's just, before we go and talk about politics and government mm -hmm. in general, bring me up to date on what's happening. Fracking, for instance. Well, fracking is still a very, very controversial idea. Um, the governor is in three and a half plus years now. And he's managed to not Make reach a conclusion <laughs> about it. It's being studied. And, um, and a lot of people fault him for not coming down one way or the other. My own view is I don't like it. And now that I'm free of my regulatory hat, I can tell you I don't like it. I think the uh, costs of it and the long-term implications are bigger than the benefit. Um, and I don't like what I see in other states. I don't like the way... A lot of the contracts were sought, uh, especially in western New York where these sharp operators came and put a check and a contract on somebody's kitchen table in their farmhouse where they're struggling to make ends meet and sign contracts that allow them to leave uh, the dirty wastes behind, the unused equipment, all yeah. of that stuff. So um, while the governor has continued to study it, the price of natural gas has come down where a lot of these projects that people want to do are not as economic as they so want it to be. they're not making as much money. They're not, but it also means that the people that would have these contracts are at even greater risk of getting all the burden, yeah, the, the junk, and, everything. Uh, and not necessarily getting the income. Um, the Keystone Pipeline, it's bringing what? Oil down from Canada to the Gulf so we can export, it can be exported by the Canadians? Is that basically what it is? Well, we get a, the, I mean, the we get arrangement is complicated, yeah. but yeah. the U.S. certainly, the yeah. partners all get a piece of that. But uh, the first point to be made about that, it's coming from tar sands. Yeah. That's a messy business. Um, it's worth looking, you can do it online. Look at some of these sites where this stuff is pulled out and processed. It's a mess. Um, do we need to do this? Maybe the president's doing what uh, the governor has been doing, which is, I don't have to do this right now. <laughs> I'm going to punt a while longer. And it keeps getting framed in economic terms and uh, independence terms and security terms. But, you know, I reminded a friend of ours uh, who was in the Kerry administration with us that when we did the first energy master plan for Governor Kerry, we killed six nuclear power plants that were proposed in New York. And the then chairman of Con Ed, Chuck Luce, and all the utility chairmen from the state came to a meeting in the office in the Red Room in, in uh, Albany. And Chuck Luce pointed to me and said, Governor, we like this young man you've got in this job, but he really doesn't know what he's doing. And what he doesn't realize is nuclear power is the future, and we need more of it, not less of it, and you're making a terrible, terrible mistake. New York can't get to the future without those six nukes. Well, lo and behold, we did kill them. The governor wanted them killed, and we killed them. And we did it because they didn't know what the, where the wastes are going to go. Mm -hmm. Well, the state didn't collapse. The energy mm -hmm. system didn't collapse. Um, the decision not to do that helped drive a lot of the economy toward alternatives. Mm -hmm. I think with these, these big, messy things, Same thing. um, don't be afraid to say no if that's what the mm -hmm. science tells you. And lo and behold, we'll get over it. And history has shown that you can be right um, when you do that. It's, um, when we talk about, there was a big ad in the Times, mm -hmm. we need more nuclear uh, plants or whatever you call them. But in my mind, I see with, the, with all the discussion about gas in Europe and natural gas and the need there, that we're going to come up with some kind of a pipeline from the West across the country. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing. It's just such a mixed up thing and such a, a, a group of different interests, isn't it? But it all comes down to the same interests, which are the the providers, the energy. And um, most of them are, couch their arguments in terms of markets and you can't yeah. interfere in the market. And, and jobs. But almost all of those markets are subsidized by the American taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Nuclear power is subsidized. Mm -hmm. uh, oil and gas, because of the tax code, is subsidized in a lot of ways. So uh, I used to argue 
that what we need to do is put every energy form on an equal economic footing. That if we're, nu if we're subsidizing nukes, we'll then subsidize solar, and if we're doing that, also subsidize uh, conservation and wind and so forth. And we don't always do it, but the arguments are always put in these broad philosophical mm -hmm. terms, and most of the arguments are, to a, to a certain extent, self-serving. Are you, after all this time, you were the commissioner of the environmental... No, e energy. Energy and transportation. Right. I think the first time I worked with you was on transportation on the bond issue because I worked at the Port Authority. Right, right. And actually the bond issue was responsible for Jimmy and my, my husband and I getting married. Under the banner of romance <laughs> blossoms, <laughs> under so the banner of So tell me prisons. something. Are you pleased nowadays? Do we have the same kind of... Of, of agencies operating and the same kind of um, leadership to them? I would say that we have been in a very, very cynical period in our politics, nationally, locally. People are angry. The anger is stoked in a lot of ways by there being too much media intensity that mm -hmm. inflates small things and doesn't distinguish between important things and so forth. And so the electorate, the citizenry, which should always be part of their government, is too angry too often on too many things. Democracy is a contact sport, so you have to be in it yeah. if you really want to make a difference. So um, it bothers me with that much cynicism that uh, leaders uh, have trouble leading and a lot of good people are run off from the system because they need so much money which is uh, foolishly unregulated, and with this Supreme Court is getting worse, not better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the average citizen, if there is such a person, um, who wants to be responsible, wants to participate, wants to contribute, is turned off too much. And we, as a country and community, we need to change that. Um, because, um, uh, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, or either I, that or I made this up, was when you choose not to participate, you guarantee that you will be governed right. by people less good than yourself. Mm -hmm. The uh, media, the television, and everything else, they seem to be setting the pace. I don't know, or the, and the polling, and the idealistic sense that you really want to serve for the public good, mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't seem to occur to anybody anymore. So the cynicism is also on the coverage of it. Yeah, you know, the, and the, the competition for the coverage uh, with these all around the clock and all these internet services and everything else, there is so much media, but I would argue that there isn't that much Something. more information right. than we used to be able to get. Right. Um, but it does ramp things up in a way. Um, I'm, I frankly know all I need to know about the Kardashians. I don't need to know anything else, but I'll bet in flipping the dial tonight, before I'm done, I'll find some information about, you know, something as, as trivial as that. And um, the serious point is that um, for all the process and all the information systems, we're not improving the quality of the information on which we act as a people. And I think that's bad. When you went into public service, though, it was really to make a difference, right? I came back from Vietnam, and uh, it seemed to me the only thing to do was try to get into this, because for my life, my generation, uh, that was the most serious mistake, error of judgment, mm -hmm. um, scandal, if you will, that government made in my lifetime. And um, people were committed to the issue differently, but um, uh, if you want to measure when, when government gets it right and when they get it wrong, they get it right when they do Social Security, when they come to the aid of beleaguered Europe. Um, they get it wrong when then they invent a reason to go into Iraq um, with no plan, no honesty about it, and so forth. So for me, it made public service uh, was something that always interested me. Politics interested me. And at that time, it seemed the most worthy thing to do. And I went to work on Capitol Hill, as you know. And mm -hmm. from there, I met Governor Kerry. And, you know. it's, um, it's also, uh, they go, the first thing the state governments have done is to go after the public servants. And they look upon them, people now, public people look upon public servants as living on a, you know, on a dole almost, that they have all these rights and all these things and everything else. I mean, that, what did, when did that happen? I, I'm older than you are, and my generation believed in it. <laughs> I don't know what hap when it happened. Yeah, and 
You know, there was, in the early days, the, 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 the right likes to talk about the founders and everything else, but there were a couple of important concepts. One was the idea of a citizen army. The other was the idea of a citizen legislature. And um, over time, we've lost both of those things. We have an all-volunteer army. Many of those are like economic conscripts. When there was a draft, everybody was sort of in the militia for a period of time. Right. And that had a very leavening effect, that you had citizen soldiers, not professional soldiers. And in legislatures, I remember when I was first in Washington, I knew some folks, Maryland, the Maryland legislature met every other year for 60 days. And the people went back to their lives. Yeah. Here in New York now, they get a pretty decent income. They're under assault if they do anything else. But constitutionally, we never said legislating in New York is a year-round full-time job. Right. But now, if anybody in the legislature also does something else, we act like they violated their constitutional obligation to be a legislator all the time. I think we'd be better off in Albany if the legislature met every other year. Um, For what it does. And the city council. Yeah, I mean, legislatures don't need to be 12 months But they are year. supposed to be the balance, aren't they, to the governor? Absolutely. Yeah. But it doesn't need to be at this level of intensity. And it's one of the things now, because of the possibility of influence, on every branch of government, at every level, uh, that money and special interests, and everybody thinks their interest is special, <laughs> by the way, mm -hmm. um, can have a disproportionate effect on public policy. But and the, that's terrible. And the, but the power of the incumbent, who in my estimation now most of the people are looking for the next job they're going to have. So we don't find the same courage that we had other times. We find people who are going to try to satisfy the, the medium thing in the poll, right, and move on to the next mm -hmm. spot. So we, we have this, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm saying the governor is responsible for the two houses that are so dysfunctional because it empowers him, right, in New well, York. Well, you know, people look but in, at... A, in the city, yeah. this mayor did the opposite, which I don't think is good either, yeah, is that he yeah. picked the speaker. Yeah, yeah. Well, the people do tend to look at the governor and hold him for the legislature, for the mm -hmm. problems of the legislature. I don't think that's entirely fair, think, particularly okay. if we have if we have checks and balances as we think we do. But you know, it's interesting watching uh, Andrew Cuomo. Uh, he's done a couple of very big things because the timing was right. He was willing to step out at exactly the right time. He's an exquisitely sharp political thinker. And so uh, <laughs> the country's flapping around, people talking about um, uh, marriage equality, and boom, um, he springs <laughs> and it happens with almost no um, uh, elaborate fanfare. So um, some of the governing that's going on right now on some of these broader issues is pretty good, uh, despite the fact that uh, Albany's awash in its scandals and all of the rest. Uh, but I don't think it's entirely fair to say uh, the governor needs to fix the legislature, and I don't know the name of my assemblyman. I do. Yeah, but, but that <laughs> most right. people, if you stop, right. we that's go out, true. I agree. Nobody, with nobody you. knows who, right. who represents them, right. but they know they don't like them. Why are we so sure that the Democrats are going to lose the Senate? And why does everybody, when they're writing in the newspaper, when they're on television, say that? Why does that happen? Well, that's the current state of the pack. That, that it's uh, the fashion, <laughs> right? It's, it, it's it's the it's the storyline, and I learned a long time ago in every campaign. I've ever been involved in. Somebody's rising, somebody's fault. There's no such thing as a baseline that stays from May to the election day in November, right? And so it's a mid-year, so we put on our mid-year thinking caps and we start reporting all of the signs and so forth and the trends and, and all of that. Um, I think the Democrats can hold the Senate. I think they've got the record on which to hold it and their willingness to have finally partially broken this nonsense of the filibuster, freed up some, uh, some process. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a washout at all. But right now, that's the line of thinking. But as soon as something happens, it's like when the guy got elected in Massachusetts for Ted Kennedy's seat. Suddenly that was like the harbinger of everything that was going to follow. Right. Right? Right. The guy couldn't even hold the, the right. seat. Right? But I think what's happening now is everybody's saying, oh, the Senate could go, the Senate could go. Something will happen, somebody will look better, and suddenly it'd be the Republicans are losing their um, advantage going into it. 
So it's got a long way to I go. I spoke to someone yesterday who's a fundraiser for candidates, and she's raising funny for sh money for Shaheen, who is now the, uh, the target of uh, whatever his name was. What's his name? I don't uh, know. Scott something. Scott, yeah. yeah. And she says it's very close, that they're all very worried. I said, that is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, nobody uses common sense. Mm. Why? And then the other question is, why today would people vote for a Republican? You know upstaters better than I do. Do you think that, um, that Democrats will vote for a Republican or stay home on a congressional race this year? Nick? Well, people do tend to stay home when they are not going to vote their usual pattern or they don't know what to do. Upstate, it turns out that the SAFE Act, uh, where Governor Cuomo stepped up and, and pursued a pretty vigorous anti-gun Mm -hmm. or at least an anti-assault yeah. weapon thing, and he's taken some lumps for that. And that's, I think, having a measurable effect up there. So that could reduce turnout. He's got a stronger economic record upstate than he's getting credit for because these other issues, gay mm -hmm. marriage, um, uh, guns, are mm -hmm. trumping um, uh, you think that they uh, really public are. attention to some of this stuff. So he's got to work that harder, and I think he, he's doing that. Um, but um, you take this thing in... in uh, uh, with uh, 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 Scott, whatever his name is, from Massachusetts, <laughs> has a summer house in New Hampshire. He says, well, I can go there. Right. And then suddenly I'm, I'm a worthy candidate for the Senate, and he's which I just got thrown out of in the last election. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Too. Yeah, it is. Do you um, have a, any kind of suggestions for the guns in the country? Nothing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't like guns. I don't know many people who had my experience in war who liked guns. Governor Kerry was, as you remember, very, very... Mm, very um, much. Uh, I think um, this is one of those things that it got away from us as a people, and a concerted um, demagogic lobby has managed to define the issue in terms that are almost impossible to answer. And um, good, solid citizens, sporting people, who like guns, who use them and everything else, are not the issue. Mm. It's the way in which the political arm, the NRA, through every device available in the political system, has managed to redefine the Constitution in a way that has gone unanswered. And they've got a stranglehold on um, too many politicians uh, who are very, very fearful because when they come to town to do you in, they really uh, do, yeah. They put money, they put people, they put ads, and um, they've got a track record now that scares the daylights mm. out of a lot of politicians. It's, but I, I don't know anybody has an answer to that. Mm. Uh, um, you know, Chuck Schumer is very active on the assault weapon stuff, but even there, the, the right, uh, uh, the, the NRA and crowd are now d defining fewer and fewer things as assault weapons, you know. Mm. Uh, so I think it's a tough one. You, um, you were chair of the Long Island Power Authority. So what do you think about the Port Authority? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the LIPA job was probably the worst job I ever had. Right. Didn't pay, and nobody was happy with anything. Right. Um, well, you and I have common experience with the Port Authority. You were there at a period of time. You know, it was originally called the, the Port, Port of Authority. <laughs> the Port of Authority. And that's I <laughs> always loved it. And it's right. on the building yeah. down where uh, Google is now. Right, because that's, every New Yorker said it that way. Yeah. Right, and they really believed, I thought, when I was in the Port Authority, yeah. that they were the authorities. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's go on. What do you think now? I think Chris Christie is a brilliant political figure. And he gets caught, his administration gets caught, doing some pretty stupid, sloppy, retributive politics. And he... Uh, dodges and weaves and fires people and now they're grand juries and everything else. And he says, no, 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 the problem isn't what these people did. The problem is with the Port Authority itself. Yeah, we got it. It's ungovernable. Right. The structure is no good. The two governors, the two states and everything else. So he changes the subject, which is classic political uh, misdirection. And three days later, the Times is uh, uh, editorializing on the subject. And um, last week, uh, Senator Schumer is uh, opinionating on it. And so I think the effort to change the subject has been somewhat successful. And that is, um, is this the ideal arrangement for an uh, interstate compact? What people don't always realize of the Port of Authority is that it's a, a federally uh, um, uh, uh, blessed 
arrangement because compacts between the states have to be approved by the Congress. Yeah. And this went way, way back. And look what it built and look what it's done over the years. Um, the political arrangement where Jersey does the chairman, New York does the executive director, and everything else, has gotten more political in recent years. There used to be a certain amount of politics at the top. You had very strong executive directors. Uh, look at the gang that built the first World Trade Center. There's some pretty right. strong right. people there building airports and so on. And so I don't think it is a structural problem. I think the governors need to resolve the politics of how it basically became divided into two fiefdoms. And, and that's wrong. And they were using money not for for the purposes of the Port Authority. I mean, to, to use the money to pay for parking lots or to use the money to build the bridge, which has nothing to do with the interstate compact, was, is really a total misuse. Oh, and it kept it getting further and further. Remember, there was a time they wanted the Port Authority to uh, take over Aqueduct. I mean, there's always an idea. When, <clears throat> once there's a pot of money and an ability to spend it. So that was the board. Uh, yeah. Well, That's the, the political appointing. The boards need to sort of recover the authority that they had, right. and the governors need to depoliticize it. But I think structurally, constitutionally, I don't know that when that's I worked where the, at the problem board I, th I thought it worked very well, actually. Yeah. I was there, Kerry was there, I th the governor. And you had uh, Steve Peter Berger, Goldmark, Peter Goldmark, Peter Goldmark. real quality Yeah, and I was looked upon with great suspicion because I came in as a manager there, and that meant it was a political appointment. Right. Yeah. So if I was the big political appointment, <laughs> it was really r kind of crazy, but yeah. it worked well, and it provided and improved the systems. But I'm not sure that New York is as blameless as we think right now. I mean, I thought the question of raising the toll on the bridge on the bridges, they negotiated that so that the governors could come in and lower yeah, the that, toll. That was I mean, like, that is that's, petty that's use of a big thing. political theater. And it's that terrible. really has no place. Yeah. Right? So you ran for public office. I Once, remember that campaign very Once. well. Did I publicly support you? You did. Good. You were lovely. Because you were the greatest <laughs> candidate. Um, how did you come away from that? I never expected to win because I had no money. And what I did hope to happen, this was the 1998 uh, Democratic primary for governor. It was going to be George Pataki's first re-election. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I thought he was not vulnerable, and therefore there would only be a B, C, and a D list in my party, and I could be the good government guy. Well, there was a B, C, and D yeah. list right. in the party. <laughs> and uh, that I could be discovered by the Times or somebody mm -hmm. who would say, he doesn't have much money, but he's got the resume, he's got uh, uh, the character uh, to make mm -hmm. a good candidate. It just didn't work, because uh, the Times, which gave me so much encouragement. Also, um, in the big profile they did of me, pointed out in the very first line that I had no money. So they were, uh, at the time, campaigning for uh, campaign finance reform, but pointing out I wasn't viable because I didn't have any money. So it was a chicken and egg kind of a thing. But I expected that. So I have no regrets about doing it. Um, the party made a terrible choice. Peter Vallone was not really running for governor. He was running for the Democratic nomination so that he would get the visibility for 1999, the following year when he was running for mayor. That didn't even work on that strategy because he didn't get the nomination in 1999. And he for wouldn't mayor. have been elected mayor, I don't think. And he wouldn't have made it. So it, but I, I, I have no regrets. So it did, I, not regrets about running, but what did it make you feel about the system? And then you never ran again. Well, about six months after that election, I wrote a <coughs> piece for the New York Times, top of the fold in the op ed page, and it was, I need $25 million. And why do I need $25 million? Because in two years, we're going to have a Senate race in New York, and I want to run for Senate. That means I have to, ri to raise $12 million a year. That's a $1 million a month. That's $250,000 a week. It's $50,000 every day for the next two years to have the $25 million to be a candidate for the United States Senate. And guess what? I can't do that. People give you money for only two reasons. One is because they have to because of some office you already have, or two, they think you're going to win. I didn't have a base, and nobody thought I was going to win. But I never had to face that problem because Hillary came to New York, and, that was the <laughs> end. and she spent $38 million. But you, when you were running, I want to go back to the governor race. When you were running for governor, <coughs> the party really prevented you from getting the 25% so you'd automatically get on the ballot, didn't they? The party used to orchestrate the convention in multi-party, right. And get 
all the worthy candidates onto the ballot. Mm -hmm. The process didn't work that year. We had some very weak leadership in the party. And so I had to go out and do the petitions, which wasn't a bad thing for me because it was, it was an organizing device. I traveled and we did three or four mm -hmm. times the number we needed to do mm -hmm. for petitions. Uh, but it shouldn't have happened that mm -hmm. way. But, uh, so they let you, they did let you get on. Oh, oh you, no, I, they didn't. You did the I, did, I couldn't yep. get on it. I came up a point, a point and a half short at the convention, so I had to go do petitions. 30 days later, we were on the ballot. So you did have the experience of traveling around. Oh, yeah. And you get yeah. encouraged when you talk <coughs> to people, right? Yeah, and people are That's, nice. Yeah. People actually treat, <coughs> people treat somebody who steps out to do this, for the most part, with respect. That's what I found. So you're still interested in electoral politics? Not necessarily for yourself, but working for other people to try to I've get I've always, people in. I mean, this is all I've ever done, so sure. Uh, and you don't know what you're going to do next? Well, I keep retiring, so now <laughs> I have to, I have to <laughs> retire long enough to find very out what good. it's you're like. Very you lucky. Know. Are uh, you writing any plays? I'm always writing a play. I started a political play, which I thought I'd have done this year, and then we had a couple of grandchildren this year, and I so when spent you, too much time with them. When you finish, you'll come back, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll you come to the opening. Right? <laughs> thank you. And <laughs> you, thank might you. Recog you might recognize somebody. Oh, all right. <laughs> thank you, Jim LaRock. <laughs> Always good to see you, Ryan. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.